Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Report, where we not only give you reviews, but we also give you, well, actually, we not only give you news, but we do give you views and clues to what's going on in the superhero channel that we love. Um, I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. We have a lot, a lot of news to discuss, rumors to discuss. Brian, how are you? Busy keeping up with the news. Like, I feel like we're waiting for Loki on the one hand, but there's Hollywood definitely feels like it is back operational because oh, yeah. there's just a lot of stuff and probably a lot of stuff that's not true, but it's just fun to kind of see the headlines. There's a lot of them every day now. Oh, yeah. Um, we're going to get into a lot of stuff here today. We're going to get into Disney Plus and Disney overall and the new ND- NWO that's being discussed and how that might change everything. Uh, Shang-Chi and the Internals may not hit China, apparently, they're talking about. I don't know if that's necessarily true. That's just people talking, I think. Um, McGregor, you're McGregor talking about filming Obi-Wan. Um, and he provides some some interesting insights into that. Robbie pushes for Harley and Ivy film, which is like, if you think about what Birds of Prey did the first time, it's like, all right, Robbie. Um, Emily Blunt surprisingly says stuff to like kill and and this sounds like yo either she is a fantastic actress and says some really harsh words to make us believe that she is not involved at all or she's not not interested what can we do but move on uh martin freeman uh shares his his interesting uh talk with uh mr ryan coogler about uh black panther 2 and its story uh, Deborah Snyder says Zack Snyder's Justice League was about closure. Uh, that's going to be an interesting conversation. And and we'll get into uh, Brian's thoughts on Jupiter's legacy as he's finished the series. Also, we get into some rumors about Ghost Rider mm-hmm. appearing in Doctor Strange 2. Also, Hulk solo film. And it's much needed redemption of that character. Before we get into all that, please let us know in the, um, in the comments section below what you think of the show. Also, hit that like and subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share it with your friends. It really does help support the channel. Now, Disney Plus, Disney, and the new NWO. There's been we spoke about this a long time ago when they talk about when they spoke about their their reorganization of the company and how they're going to be able how they're going to be doing things from now on. They appointed a few individuals there to be the heads, I guess, of different aspects of their their company and their content. And some some more news came out about individuals uh, taking over certain aspects of the content that we've been seeing, such as uh, Marvel, uh, uh, Star Wars, and various others. Brian, I read that. Uh, article in Variety. I'll put I'll put that in the description below so that you guys can check it out. And I was watching the John Campion show, and John Campion was simply saying that this may be the end. This this may be the beginning of the end of Disney, or more or less the shows that we're getting and how good they are. I don't necessarily agree with him too much. But it's hard to say because this is just the beginning. Um, as we know, Bob Chapek, Iger is leaving in December, and Bob Chap- Chapek has been increasingly being involved in more and more aspects of how the things are run, and he's definitely going to put his footprint on everything. What are your thoughts on this change up? And do you think that the content that we've been getting, which has been quality, if I may say so, so myself, and I believe you agree, do you think it's going to suffer? At least not now, possibly, but later on. So the gist of the Variety article is this idea that historically television shows had a showrunner and that these shows tended to be mostly driven from the writer's room versus a feature film is driven from the director's chair. Mm-hmm. And the article was positing that Marvel and Disney in trying to run their television shows more like feature films are doing so without showrunners 
And so they're effectively using kind of Kevin Feige in the parliament as sort of the producer with power. And then there's kind of the, the creator slash director who has power. It's not necessarily the lead writer. And the article had some quotes from some disgruntled writers saying, listen, writing talent does not want to, writing talent for television does not want to mix with that kind of a hierarchy. They would rather be working on TV shows where they have more clout. And so therefore over the long run, this model that Disney and Marvel is trying is, is not gonna work or, or is going to be left with substandard talent. My double reaction to that is number one, they're trying something new. That doesn't mean that the way they're doing it today is the way they're going to be doing it five to 10 years from now. They're looking at the landscape of, we just did 22 films and now we have the streaming service, which we didn't have before, an in-house streaming service we didn't have before. We're trying to link this universe and build this world. And this is the tact we're gonna take. But if they were to run into labor issues or talent issues, there's nothing that says they can't pivot to a showrunner model yeah. for future shows to appease writing talent they want to recruit. So I look at the article as very static and I look at Marvel and Disney as very dynamic. And I kind of say like, well, the article doesn't really acknowledge the fact that Marvel has always shown an ability to course correct. So why yeah. would this be any different? My second reaction is, the talent that is disgruntled, is that old guard established writing talent that's saying that? And does newer, younger writers who I might argue Marvel and Disney might want to feature anyway, are they as hung up on this versus, hey, they get a chance to play in the big, you know, kind of IP sandbox that is Marvel. Mm -hmm. They don't care what the setup is. I think that's less clear from the article. So I think... My overarching take is when you're this successful, people are going to be looking to write articles that are sounding the death knell of what you're doing. Yeah. But I think you have to just respect the fact that the organization is smart enough to perceive if they're not getting the people into the seats that they want, mm -hmm. they're going to look at why and make adjustments mm -hmm. as opposed to just saying, great, we're just accepting the content's going to step down a couple of inches. I don't, I, I don't see that. I would say that based on what I read, there's certainly there's some nervousness as to how things are going to move forward uh, because there's just, you know, the fear of, uh, you know, the unknown and it's, you know, how it seems that the, the way they're used to doing things is going to change. Um, how much will it change? You have someone, uh, so a person uh, by the name of, uh, I believe his last name is Bergman, whom they consider to be more of a businessman, having more of a say in terms of content creation and, and, and creative uh, 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 say into some of the, the shows, I guess. So that brings along a little bit of uncertainty to those people who are you know, making these shows and having someone come in and say, oh, I don't like this, do this, do that, do this. And them having no say in that matter at the end of the day, possibly, can pose a little bit of a, 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 a you know, scared sort of a reaction or uncertain reaction as to how will they continue moving forward? Is it something that they're willing to put up with? For the long term, or there's something, you know, if it gets to if it gets to a point where it becomes a little bit of an annoyance or frustration, then they might move on to somewhere else, right? Um, I guess there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh protocols that were in place before are about to change. And there seems to be some confusion as to how they go about, I guess, getting their ideas out. So I, I think <clears throat> listen. They've been successful thus far. I don't think that these new guys that are in the, the, the chair of deciding what goes where and when and all that other stuff, I don't think they're going to play with what's been working. I think they're smart enough to understand that they, they are successful and they're not going to try to step on, obviously not Kevin Feige's shoes. Um, Kathleen Turner has been doing... Um, a phenomenal job thus far with the Star Wars franchise, I, I think anyway. 
um, with the Mandalorian show and the up and coming shows that they have going, um, which we just we'll, we'll talk about later with um, your McGurry and the Obi Wan show. Uh, I think they're but I think the lightning. Star Wars model is different, right? So if I understand it right, Favreau and Filoni are showrunners. So Disney okay. is using a showrun, a more traditional model in the Star Wars show. This was a Marvel specific comment that they're not using a showrunner. So yeah, yeah, this is yeah. part of my point of like, things can change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we haven't heard, I mean, it's, we're only two shows in, but we have not heard complaints from, I think it was Matt Shackman is the create was the creator of, um, of WandaVision and Malcolm Spellman was the creator for Falcon and Winter Soldier. We have not heard any complaints from them about the way they were, they were managed or run. I would also say we've seen strengths and weaknesses from the Marvel approach already. I think one of the strengths actually came to the fore in the press this week where Malcolm Spellman was saying, you know, we wrote this show. We kind of wrote this speedy, shady CIA type character. And it was actually the parliament that came to us and said, it should be Madame Hydra. And we, and, he, and his, his recount of that is yeah, yeah. we're looking around and being like, wait, we can use that. And so you see right there the synergy of them saying, well, here's the catalog. I see what you wrote. Why don't you install this character because it connects with what we're doing here, here, and here. That's the positive. The negative I think we've seen is the finales. The finales are feeling a little bit uncertain and confused and feeling mm -hmm. like there's maybe too many people in the room saying we got to service this and we got to service that. And maybe that's an argument for traditional writer model where if you had one leading voice, you might have gotten a better finale. So all of that is TBD. We're two shows in. Yeah. Um, but I go back to my point, which is this is a dynamic business. They're going to do what works and delivers product that meets their standard and the audience standards. So I just, I'm, I'm not that worried yeah, that yeah, this yeah. is somehow going to upend the whole approach. Yeah, I'm not worried as well. I, I, I think there's certain things to really, you know, ask the question whether or not this will affect the quality of the shows and... Are there people there to pat themselves on the back so that can say, oh, I did that, did this, and I said that, and this changed because of me or whatever? We don't know yet. Right. Um, but I certainly don't think this is the beginning of the end, at least not yet. It's too early. I think it's also not clear. Does Marvel want the same people running and writing every season of the shows that wind up being more than one season? I mean, we are used to these if it's Lost, it's Damon Lindelof. If it's Battlestar Galactica, it's Ronald Moore. We're used mm. to having one person manage the show, but that's not always the way it goes. There are definitely mm. successful shows in history where the showrunner has changed many times along the way. And so Marvel might want almost like a comic writer has a run and then another comic writer has a run. Marvel may want like, hey, if we're doing season two of Loki, we actually want different people to write that just to have a little different flavor. Maybe their choice. We'll see. Yeah. 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 So a lot of things to um, consider, but I, I, still nothing to be too concerned. This is, again, as you said, you know, they are transitioning over to the streaming platform. There's something that they never had before and something that they have to focus on and they have to have a certain way of doing it. And if, if it doesn't work out, we believe they have the ability to course correct and make things better. Before we move on though, I wanted to ask you this. This change from Friday to Wednesday with regards to Loki, do you believe they're setting themselves up for a multi-day release of Marvel content so that we're not used to just seeing Marvel on a Friday? but rather on multiple days to, I guess, dominate, I guess, more days than just Friday, I guess. What are your thoughts? I think that? that's right. I think that's right. So first off, there's been some, there's been some reports that what if is coming out earlier than people thought. So if you just kind of look at what's ahead on the calendar, you're going to have a moment where you're going to have three or four of these shows that are active at once. And so I think it, I just, we, we can love them all we want, but if you release them all on the same day, it's kind of hard to get to all yeah. of them in due course. Yeah. And so I think about it more as in the mindset of an, you know, a, 
1990s NBC or ABC or CBS, and they're thinking about here's our Monday, here's our yeah, Tuesday, yeah. here's our Wednesday lineup, our Thursday lineup, and they're kind of trying to slot like what tone, what genre, what do we want to be putting in front of you each day of the week? I think that's probably where we're headed. And yeah. don't forget, you know, Marvel's doing its thing, but there is a conversation that above them is happening alongside what's going on with star wars and what's going on with animated and what's going on with sort of other shows that are coming out like you know we don't pay attention to things like the mighty ducks remake but disney does so yeah, they yeah. need to think about the release schedule as a menu of all of these products and i just think yeah a, a marvel day you could do that but it's a, even for us it would be a lot and there's a yeah. chance that we might miss like one of the shows would get lost in the shuffle if they do have too many of them coming out at once yeah, yeah, yeah. uh yeah let us know what you guys think about this disney reshuffling and the new individuals that will be coming in to just sort of uh head the release of of marvel star wars all these other content and how they'll be doing it from now on and what you think it'll do you think as some people may say is the beginning of the end of, of, of marvel and superhero uh, uh the superhero genre i i don't think so i think it's too early to tell uh but let us know in the comment section below next up shang chi and the eternals may not uh hit china i think this is just people writing stuff just to ask the question because of you know how China is and the negativity that's been um, written about the Shang-Chi trailer and some of the comments that um, uh, Chloe Zhao has made in the past and China made no mention of her big win at the Academy Awards do you think They'll shut down the release of, uh, of Shang-Chi and the Eternals in China? It seems, I mean, given how popular Marvel has been in China across the board, it seems hard to believe that Marvel would have moved forward with a project where there was this much risk to them being able to even show it in what is a top two box office market around the world let alone one film that is asian centric and you know the obviously the other the the director is is of asian descent i have to think it gets ironed out somehow um now you know does it affect the audience reaction to one or both of these i mean that's harder to say right we did see that sort of shang chi reaction that didn't come from the chinese government that was theory from the chinese audience that didn't like what they saw yeah. versus loving you know black widow and loving that content so i don't know i mean i will say it would be a big blow to marvel if the chinese box office for either of these films was reduced or you know heaven forbid eliminated i mean it'd be, it'd be difficult for these yeah. movies to really be highly profitable without that i mean they're counting on that for several hundred million and i would say in Shang Chi's case, you're probably counting on that to be at least half of the the global take that they yeah. would have been estimating. So uh, I saw that and I was like, I, I have no doubt it's a it's alarming on one level, but like I said, I just find it hard to believe they would agree with these projects with like, hey, it's a coin flip whether we get to show this in China. Yeah, or not. yeah. I think they'll do well. I still think they'll do well. I think that I still think that there there are people who um are going to want to see this and again china keeps a lot of this box office right so it's money that are they just gonna leave at on the table just for the sake of you know not liking whatever they you know it's money at the end of the day they're not gonna say no to money so i still think that they're gonna do well in in china and, and again we still haven't seen much of what they've shown they've shown us very little and i think the more they show leading up to uh the release of these films i think the more excited or more curious people are going to get and i think it'll do just fine uh let us know in the comment section below 
whether China is not going to release these these movies. I, I I doubt that they won't. I doubt that they will. How would I say? It? I doubt that they will. They will shut them down. Meaning they're not going to show them in China. I think they'll do just fine. Um, next up, McGregor talks filming. Your McGregor talks filming the new Obi Wan. Listen, I've said it in the past, Brian, that this show is going to be bigger than The Mandalorian. There's a lot of things to wonder about this show. Um, you, first of all, we want to see what lengths did Obi-Wan had to conceal the identity of Luke Skywalker. Um, there are people that are going to want to see, hey, hating Christians and coming back as Darth Vader, that's huge. Is there going to be any connection to the Mandalorian? There are a lot of things that we do not know about this show. The only thing we know is that Ewan McGregor, Darth Vader, and a great cast uh, are, are part of this show. Your thoughts? So McGregor's comments, I think he was really touting this technology that they, they developed in The Mandalorian, which is, yeah. so for people who don't aren't familiar, it's a, it's a green screen that isn't a green screen. So you go into a warehouse and there's a studio set up and it's like you're acting against the green screen. But then instead of that, there's these like really advanced LED panels and the actual environment that you're in is put on the screen. Yeah. So you are now acting opposite an actor and you feel like you're walking in the desert or you're in Coruscant or wherever you are. And so he has said that this has made a huge difference in the realism and the emotion that he's able to deliver in the character. And then he also was kind of criticizing, as he said that, what happened in the prequels where it was all green screen, old yeah. school green screen yeah. and felt very wooden and very boring yeah, when he yeah. was doing the character for George, George Lucas. So he's been very uh, effusive in his praise of that. He also teased, I believe he said his hair is longer than we've ever seen it. And I believe the longest we ever saw it was Attack of the Clones, right? That's right. where he has the long hair. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to see what that looks like. Uh, there's been no comment from Hayden Christensen yet. Although I did have this thought the other day, Pablo, which is, um, I, I mean, James Earl Jones is probably too old at this point to really, I know he did the Vader voice in Rogue One, but I was thinking like, I don't believe Christensen would have come back if he wasn't voicing the character. Like if he was just doing the physical character, what is he actually doing then? Cause then he's in the mask and the suit and we don't ever see him. And if they've got James Earl Jones doing the audio, what's the point? So I'm guessing he's Vader, but it's his voice being dubbed to sound like James Earl Jones. No one has commented on this, but I, I kind of was thinking about this the other day. I think we will see him without his helmet on a, on, on, on other occasions. I think it'll be Hayden Christensen um, acting out whatever situation him outside of the okay. Vader uh, helmet. Uh, I, th I think I, I'm thinking that that's what we'll see. Okay, so that'd be like the animated show where he would pop up and there were times where he would lose part of his helmet, like part or all of his helmet you would actually see anakin's or like the remains of anakin's face as part of that show so and i also it just yeah th there were some um things that i read in the past about um how darth vader was coping with him being darth vader and the excruciating pain that he was going through being inside that uh that that suit or that helmet right. and I think we might get some of that as well. Yeah. So it's going to I think it's going to be very interesting to see, man. I think again, this is going to be one of uh the better shows when it does release. Everybody's going to be excited to see Darth Vader. Come on, man. Come on, man. Everybody's going to be waiting to see that. And I do I would I would agree that being immersed in that environment and actually seeing it will probably you get a better performance. Um, because as we already know that in the Mandalorian, what we saw on screen was, was amazing. Yeah. Although they had a few little hiccups there that I pointed out in the past. Hopefully they don't, uh, do those again, but, 
Um, I would assume that they, those being involved in that environment and acting will, will change something and we'll probably get a, a great performance from him and from everyone else, which we've had so far. I just hope we, I hope we see some cool new places, you know, cause I, obviously we're going to have to deal with Tatooine again. We don't have a choice. Um, I'm guessing Mustafar will get again because oh, yeah. that's where Vader's house. So I'm hopeful, but I'm hopeful we, there's a lot of white space to play in the universe where hopefully we get to see some new planets and some new, new backdrops as the chase, or I don't know what, how they're going to structure this, but the chase is kind of playing out. Yeah. And, and I hope I, for me anyway, I hope it sort of plant seeds for the future, not necessarily the trilogy that we got that everybody, not everybody, but most people seem to agree that they weren't that great. And hopefully we get something for beyond that. Uh, so let us know what you guys think about um, McGregor talking about Obi-Wan's show and being in this new environment. And do you believe that this show is going to be, I want to say better than The Mandalorian, but it's going to be up there. It's going to be the show that people are talking about when it does come out. Um, next up, Robbie, Margot Robbie pushes for the Harley and Ivy film. To this day, Brian, I haven't seen Birds of Prey. I saw, I've seen little, um, I think I've come across it and then I've just changed the channel because I'm just, I'm just not interested. Um, did you see Birds of Prey? Yeah, I've seen it. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell, talk to me, talk to me. Talk. So this is, First of all, Margot Robbie owns the part. She does great with the part. The issue is the part itself. To me, there's a cap on Harley Quinn as a character. And the reality is Harley Quinn is a supporting character. It's not an anchor lead character to me. I, I just, you know, it's, 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 it's the second best player on a basketball team. It's like, you're not building the franchise around that player. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. if you have a good team, you need that second player to make things really go. And that's what that character is. So nothing wrong with Birds of Prey. What's wrong with Birds of Prey is I just don't think you can center a movie around Harley Quinn and make it so good and so compelling that you have to have it. Yeah. And so for her to kind of come back, I get it. She loves the character. That's great. But you know, for her to be like, well, now I just want to do this like dynamic duo with Poison Ivy. I'm like, it's kind of the same issue. It's like, you know, I think there's some hidden agenda behind it. Well, no, nah, but I mean, like, I look at like, it was the greatest question I think facing Falcon and the Winter Soldier, right? As they were taking two number twos and saying, can we elevate to to a number one? And they did a pretty good job. I mean, they did a pretty good job of getting Sam into the main line and giving him enough to say like, all right, yeah, you could actually have a movie with this guy as the lead. And I believe it, it works. Yeah, but yeah. but in order to do that, he couldn't do it as Falcon. He had to be Captain America because yeah. Captain America, you can build a franchise around. And so yeah. you, to me, it's like, where is that evolution for Harley Quinn? Like, what can she be more than she's been yeah, exactly. to make you feel like, all right, if she's going to be up against Batman one-on-one, -on -one, that's a movie I really care about. Yeah, like, yeah, I, don't, yeah, I just yeah. don't see it. And it's nothing against her. It's just the way the comics have made the character. It's limiting. So that that's my that's my fundamental issue with what she's asking for. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's somewhat of an agenda for this film to be made as well. Uh sort of similarly to like uh what's this girl elizabeth uh the person she directed i believe the last charlie's angels elizabeth oh, elizabeth banks yes you know they, they you know they have this she wants to do it because of this you, you know what i'm talking about i don't want to outwardly say it, but i think that has the same way hey the same way that, um, what's this girl's name? Um, Brie Larson has been advocating for uh, uh, all-female Avengers. Like, why do we need all-female Avengers? Just because you want one? Does it make sense? You know, it can't be just because you want it. 
right? There lies the problem. Um, in this in this world, I guess you can do whatever you want, right? But they did okay at the box office. I think the no it was a disappointment, considering it was a you know, fairly well reviewed picture. It was a disappointment. That movie did not make money. How much? How much was the the budget? Was like eighty something million? Yeah, but like the opening weekend was only like forty, if I remember correct. It was thirty for a comic book film. Was yeah. pretty. Dis- I mean, like it, they didn't even get to like where Shazam was. You know, yeah. And so. Yeah, they didn't even get to that. I don't know. It feels like one of those things again. It's like if you want to do that TV show. Yeah. Right. It's not a feature film. You want no. to do a TV show? You want to do some kind of like bad boys equivalent with like poison ivy and harley quinn it's an hbo max show it's not a movie this is not a black widow this is not a black widow black widow i think is going to do fantastic hopefully let's see but it's certainly gonna uh set the stage for marvel and the release of black widow and how well it does in the movie theaters we've already seen what other films have done and they've done fairly well and i think black widow is going to be one of them that that does fairly well if not do very well um, but how many appearances did scarjo make as black lot. widow in an ensemble picture before they gave her the their own picture a lot I mean, and she it was and a she, decade yeah. it was 10 years yeah that she put in as part of the team they even killed her off and then they gave her we're going to give you this send off and then as part of the send off they actually put her back in a team right like the, yeah. the, what we're hearing about the movie what you're seeing in the clips it's not just, it's not like her against the taskmaster one on one it's yeah, her yeah. entire family yeah. plus other supporting characters that were being teased this is being done very differently than what margot robbie's asking for question do you think before we move on, do you think Black Widow, the release of this movie, would have done better had it been released much earlier in the in the I guess in the in the order in terms of what they released? Like it would have been released, let's say, after Iron Man three. No, so I think the I think actually what elevated Black Widow into its own franchise was Winter Soldier and Civil War. I think the way she's used in the Captain America franchise gave her a lot of room, both from a physical standpoint, but also a character standpoint, especially like in Winter Soldier. She's a really interesting foil yeah, to Steve yeah. Rogers. Yeah. And I think it was after that where you started to sort of see more of the path to like, okay, I can see where she, we can move her center, yeah. have her center of the picture. And there's enough dimension here. Yeah. And, fill in the blank stuff with her story to make it interesting. I don't think had we gone straight from her Iron Man cameo, basically to, to a movie, I don't think people would have cared. And like Scarlett Johansson, like, you know, as good as, as celebrated an actress as she is, we have seen whether it's Lucy ghost in the shell. He herself doesn't, guarantee you the massive box even if she's very good at action yeah just putting her on the top of the poster doesn't get you 700 800 million and there be there have been a bunch of films like this and they haven't done that well salt colombia so the fact that this is tracking the way it is i think is really a respect out of the culmination of the way this character has evolved and gotten yeah. bigger and bigger roles to where now people are ready and wanting it yeah I agree. Let us know in the comment section below if you want to see uh, Poison Ivy and uh, Harley Quinn in a film. Or a TV show. Would you watch it? If it was HBO Max, would you watch it? I'd watch it just to see how good it is. Yeah. Not because I'm excited to see it, but I would see it just to see how good it is. Yeah. Uh, Let us know in the comment section below. Um, Next up, one of the characters that we've been hoping to see and have this actress be a part of this film has straight up said i don't like superhero films i just don't like them she'd rather do 
what Gulliver's Travel and now this new movie Jungle Cruise. She'd rather well, do that's a little disrespectful, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm just saying she signed her name on the dotted line to do these films, but yet she doesn't want to do this. And hey, listen. I'm not going to bash anybody who doesn't like superhero films. If they don't like it, they don't like it. What I'm, you know, what I'm going to say. If they don't like it, they don't like it. That's not their thing. And that's fine. I have nothing bad to say about Emily Blunt not wanting to do Fantastic Four and be the Invisible Woman. It's her choice. So be it. I think we just move on. What are your thoughts on her saying, you know, she doesn't want to do it or could this be a switcheroo and, and 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 her calling on calling andrew garfield yo how how should i say this <laughs> what you what you think oh first of all by the way did mm -hmm. you see garfield the day after he made that initial statement and he was on another show and he goes never say never <laughs> like, that guy that guy <laughs> like come on man Come on, man. What, what, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on Emily well, Blunt? The shame of it is that Emily Blunt in Edge of Tomorrow and Emily Blunt in Quiet Place, she is badass. That's yeah. the the shame of it is that you you know she'd be good at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, it, but to your point, we don't want, I mean, the genre doesn't want people that, does, that don't want to be in the genre, right? It's, it's, mm. You're not going to get a good product if the actor and actress are, I mean, that's a mail-in. Right. So by definition, if she hates the genre and she signs to do the movie, she's mailing it in for the month. So we don't want that. Yeah. We don't want that. Nobody wants that. Yeah. I don't care how good an actor you, you are. That yeah. that's not what we want. So, you know, I respect the viewpoint. It's a shame. I reserve the right of we have seen through history actors and actresses who swear off a genre. All of a sudden, there's the right director and the right project comes along and they're back in, right? I mean, classic case is Christian Bale, after he did the Dark Knight trilogy, swore off comic book filmmaking. And last I checked, he's the villain in the Thor movie. Yes. It, all it takes is one, yeah. you know? And I, I do feel like Emily Blunt, you know, she's in her prime. She's as marketable as she is right now. And she's kind of got the mix of, you know, whether it's, she got Quiet Place. She's got Mary Poppins. She's got you know Jungle Cruise. Probably is going to be a pretty big hit. Um, you got The Rock, obviously, as her co-star. That's that's never a bad thing. So, um, but it could be one of those things where a couple years from now, her career might be in a little different place. There might be a different project, and all of a sudden, she's a little more open to it. So, this is another never say never on this, yeah. but. I would also say I was a little surprised at the strength, the, the strength of the words, right? For her to just say, like, I don't like these kind of movies, like, unilaterally. Oh, the other one I was going to say was we obviously went through the Ethan Hawke thing where he kind of criticized, he, he loves comics, he criticized comic book filmmaking, and now he's the villain in Moon Knight. So, yeah. again, another example of it comes full circle sometimes. So don't rule it out. But I would say, you you know, this idea of Krasinski and Blunt being in the, 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 the upcoming Marvel Fantastic Four, that doesn't seem like it's going to happen. So. Yeah. Do you think Krasinski is still going to possibly be in it? I mean, he said he wants to. Well, I don't know why, you know, they're married, but I don't know why one of them. So the biggest constraint on why he wouldn't do it is because he had now has an exclusive first look deal with Paramount as a director. So he's done Quiet Place and he's in the Jack Ryan series for Amazon. So he's pretty tight with Paramount. The reason why he wouldn't do it would be that is that he doesn't want to straddle studios, but you know, if he's a fan of the genre, I don't think Emily Blunt's going to be like, you can't do yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Fantastic. Like, that's the, that's the, that's the divorce talk right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you agree, though, with what she said with regards to the superhero genre is saturated right now? I mean, think well, about it. There's this... this we have a bunch of shows out there, right? I think the CW is saturated. Yes, I do. CW is just ridiculous. But do you think overall 
the superhero genre is saturated with movies and, and, and shows. Do you think it's too much? And again, I mean, this leads to the, the, the question of fatigue setting in or starting to setting in, to be setting. So, uh, you know, she's not wrong, but like my, my counter to her would be content is saturated, period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how many streaming services do we have? How many shows are in action right now? you pick a genre it's saturated because <laughs> everything's getting made this is yeah. not the 1970s where we all watch four channels yeah. and we watch two movies a year yeah, yeah, yeah. so she's she's right in a sense that theaters in particular we've discussed many times they come back online are reliant on this ip these big blockbusters more than ever to make them money so mm -hmm. yeah it's saturated but you know, like I'm going through Netflix and I, I, I've been watching uh, watching Money Heist recently. There's so many action shows. There's so many spy shows. There's so many rom-coms. Like they're, they're all over the place. So saturation is everywhere. I, that would be my response to her. And and I th I think what we've seen is that like if you do if you deliver top flight content, the audience mm -hmm. finds it mm -hmm. because the buzz is there for yeah. it. So yeah. I guess I wouldn't worry about it if you really believe in in what you're doing. Yeah. Before we move on, how do you like money? How are you liking Money Heist? It's good. I like it. I yeah, actually I, um, didn't I recommend that one. I don't remember if you recommended that to me. I'm almost done with it. Um, okay. But I really like. So I was excited because Ursula Corbero, who plays Tokyo in that show, is the Baroness in the new Snake Eyes movie. And I was like, oh yeah, oh. she really looks like Baroness. I was like, good choice. Word. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I was like, when I heard that, I was like, oh, yeah, that, that's just like actually work. <laughs> the other thing I was actually thinking was, I was trying to fit where, I think his name is Alvaro Norte, who plays the professor. I was mm -hmm. trying to fit where he would go into like the MCU as kind of like a thinking bad guy or something like that. But he he, he was compelling as a character. I thought there yeah. was somewhere a spot for him. I just couldn't figure out what it was. But yeah. no, I like the show. It's yeah, good. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's a good show. Very good show. I think they have one more season and then it'll be done. Um, next up, let, oh, before we go, get into that, uh, let us know what you guys think about Emily Blunt and her not wanting to be Fantastic Four. And let us know in the comments, not, not wanting to be in the Fantastic Four film. And let us know who would you like uh, for Invisible Woman to be if it's not her. That'll be interesting. So I, I can't think of somebody that could, if it's, I, I guess, I don't know if it's just placebo. Everybody's just been talking about her. I can't think about anyone else, but I'm pretty sure there's someone else out there, but it, it, let's see. Let's see. Um, next up, Martin Freeman shares his reaction to hearing uh, Black Panther 2's story. So according to an article um, uh, written, Martin Freeman says that Ryan Kruger was there on a Zoom call and he was walking through um his character and there were some weird moments and yeah. I, I don't know what, it, what i don't know what we're gonna get with this film this is this is very i'm very curious about this film i'm pretty sure many people are curious about this film because again we're not getting a replacement for chadwick boseman in this film but I'm curious to understand what this um, respect to Chadwick Boseman is in this film. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, the, the quotes had the feel of Martin Freeman almost admitting, I don't get it. <laughs> and Ryan Kluger being, trust me, it's going to work. work. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what it felt like yeah, yeah, and yeah. you know i think a lot of times sometimes as an actor you you are in the hands of the director and you have to trust that that they'll figure it out but i think yeah. martin freeman acknowledging the complexities of removing t'challa from the fabric of the story and then feeling like his supporting character is no longer kind of grounded the way it was and i think that's kind of what he's speaking to but ryan coogler clearly has a vision and clearly feels like he's cracked the coat and solved yeah, yeah. how he wants to do this to me, I think the thing we don't have is who else is in this movie, right? So we pretty much know Shuri's gonna have the mantle for this film, and that's cool, that's awesome. But we don't know who the foils are, and we don't know where the linkages are. We know there will be some. We know that Wakanda's not gonna exist in isolation. 
And we, we don't know what other franchises we're connecting to. You know, is Sebastian Stan back in this? I mean, certainly the way Falcon the Winter Soldier was written, there's a lot of ground there to kind of rebuild or mend some fences there if that's a route they want to go. Anthony Mackie was asked this week on a podcast if he was in it. He obviously wouldn't say either way, but he kind of was like, I don't know. He's like, I don't know. But, you know, that that's a logical question, right? The, the previous uh, Civil War introduced Black Panther. Would you go back to the new Captain America? I think that's the key, don't you think? Like, we don't know what other franchises are touching this. And that, in the absence of T'Challa, they're going to need a few kind of other linkages, I think, to really make this really make this go. I know there were rumors at one point, right, that, that Namor was coming as part of this. That's We haven't heard anything, but, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that's sort of a... A, a card that that might be played in this one to kind of add a frontliner to to this. Listen, I feel like because of the success of Black Panther one, they have to top Black Panther the first film, and adding Namor to it is certainly a, a good piece to add to it. Obviously, the absence of Chadwick is also another piece that will bring people to the theaters to see what they do with this film and i'd also say that uh whatever ryan coogler was saying to martin freeman i'm sure he wasn't giving him everything right he was no. just giving him stuff about his character right that the stuff that he was confused about he doesn't know the other piece to sort of tie it all together so um hey this is gonna. This is this is definitely gonna be huge. I think, in my opinion, this is gonna be a huge film that people are gonna go see and 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 wonder. That first trailer is gonna be very interesting. That first trailer is gonna be very interesting. Let us know in the comment section below. Are you looking forward to Black Panther two, or are you somewhat worried about what they're gonna be showing us and what this uh, respect to uh, Chadwick Boseman's legacy in this film will be. Let us know in the comment section below. Uh, next up, Deborah Snyder says Zack Snyder's Justice League was about closure. And listen, sometimes I don't feel like that because you see Zack Snyder with his phone going, showing people like, what are you doing, man? What I, I, I get it. You had more to show, but you did that in four hours. You did, you gave four hours. They didn't show you this one piece and you want to, listen, man, it is over. I'm glad she said what she said about this is about closure. For those people that want, again, I'll reiterate. For those people that want the, um, the Zack Snyder verse to be released, it is over. I don't feel like it's happened. If it does happen, it's going to happen on HBO Max. It is not going to be in no film. In, in on, on theaters and stuff like that. It's over. You read the article. Tell me what you think about what she said. So a couple of points. One is if you go back when they first greenlit this, there's another article or two in there of Deborah Snyder talking about this as closure, which I've look, I, I think that's hundred percent accurate given what happened to Autumn and, and all that sort of stuff. But I do find it interesting that Deborah Snyder always talks about this as closure. And Zach always talks about this in another way. And I will say, like, his article this week, to me, you have to think, if it wasn't, that he has to know that there's nothing on the table right now. Because if you, I don't care what your experience was. And look, you and I both have agreed, like, WB has raked him over the coals for no, I mean, for no good reason, many times over including as part of this project. But if you come out and you say a studio quote tortured me every day while you're making something, you you cannot be expecting to work with that studio again. It's over. In any capacity. And that's what he said. He said, yeah. and he said like, they treat me like I'm a pain in their ass. He's like, I don't mean to be, but every day they tortured me on the making of this project. That's not the talk of a guy who's about to sign a deal with HBO Max to do three more films. And the fans want Zack Snyder to go back to that. 
And exactly why? And, and so, like, if you're Deborah Snyder, and, who's a producer, and you're Zach Snyder, who's a director, why do you want to go back to that? If that was your experience, and then he says, "My experience with Netflix was amazing with Army of the Dead," which, by the way, good reviews for Army of the Dead. Supposedly, it's very good. Mm-hmm. Why would you go back to that? That's why these fans need to chill out, yo. The, the Snyder verse, you can hashtag all you want. It is over. I'm saying it right now. It is over. Keep now, I did want to say one other thing Deborah said, which you know, she she does have in the article where she talks about like why doesn't why hasn't Warner been Warner Brothers been upfront about the viewership of this? And she kind of frames it as it's massive, but they won't tell you. I have to disagree with that because so number one is actual viewership of online stuff is by definition nebulous, right? Even when Netflix tells you like 83 million people yeah. watch extraction, it's like that's like two minutes. So they don't know how many people. Yeah, yeah. But what I would say to Deborah is the part that they can't lie about is a subscriber growth because they're a public company. And we got the subscriber numbers, and while they're growing, they didn't exponentially grow in the quarter where the Snyder cut came out. And so it wouldn't be, it would not be legal for them to lie about that number. So they can yeah. say that the existing subscribers, we don't exactly know how many of them watched the film or how much they watched, but we do know how many people signed up for the service. And the simple reality was we did not see a significant acceleration because of this project. So I have to kind of push back on this idea of like Warner Brothers is hiding this enormous amount of audience that we haven't seen because they would have had to disclose it publicly yeah. in the subscriber numbers. So listen, Snyderverse is over. Let the DC universe begin. That's all I got to say about that. Next up, uh, Brian, you finally saw Jupiter's legacy. Your thoughts on that? Thinking back so, to what I said before, what are your thoughts in comparing from what I said and your thoughts about what you saw in its entirety? So I think you were generous. Really? Wow. Because you said this had potential. And I got to the end of it and I kind of was like, <laughs> I want my eight hours back. This is pretty bad. <laughs> I really didn't like this. Yeah. Um, and I. I agree. The costumes were the high point. I, I think that's probably, I think we'd agree. Like the, the, the way the colors and the, the cuts and that was cool. I think it starts with Dumel. I really didn't like Sheldon Sampson. I kind of got so sick of his like self-righteous character. It was like Superman on, it was like the Superman on steroids and this constant devotion to this code and inflexibility and quite honestly, stupidity that it just was like, it was like by episode four, I'm like, I get it. <laughs> I get it. He's the boy scout and he's yeah, not yeah, coming yeah. off that position. Yeah, yeah. And they just kept beating that into me for four episodes. So I really didn't care for the character. Mm-hmm. Um, Dumel is a quality actor, but I just think he, I think he was miscast. Like, I don't, I don't think this was a good role for him and I don't think he played it that well. And I don't think the character was, I don't know how accurate it is to Mark Miller's comic, but it just didn't play well for me. So that was number one. Number two is, you know, spoiler alert. I thought the brainwave twist was pretty obvious early on, like just the way they set up their relationship in the yeah, 30s. Yeah, yeah, You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, the classic. Yeah. He feels jaded and underappreciated. Yeah. So, yeah, he's going to break bad and betray everyone. And yeah. and so when it came, I kind of was like, all right, I knew this is where we were going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that uh, Leslie Bibb, who was sort of Lady Liberty, just not enough to do. I actually thought that when they let her do some stuff, she was a little more interesting. That episode where she kind of was you know, in the fight herself and making her own decisions. I'm like, all right, I could, I could do a little more of this, but didn't get it. But then the last thing is, yeah, was there a fight you really, really liked in this show? I, I didn't think there was. I kept waiting for this, like, you know, heroic shot or exchange or display of powers. And I just yeah. don't think it looked kind of cheap. Like, it looked like it didn't really have the money or, or yeah. the choreography. But so I got to the end of the season, I was like, if they greenlit a second season, I'm going to be pretty surprised, to be yeah. quite honest. I, I think this is one, you know, I would recommend the audience pass. Like, save save your time. This better. Like, watch Invincible. Watch the Marvel shows. Get caught up on Umbrella Academy. The boys. Don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't go to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Um, listen, I like watching uh, 
the superhero genre and whatever they have to, I'll give it a shot. And I gave this one a shot. I think they had some potential there. I just think the way they cut it, the story that they were trying to tell didn't work. Um, I don't know if you had any similar thoughts on when episode five, when you saw episode five, when you were you thinking like them, if they would have started like this, then maybe would have had a little bit of intrigue. Um, yeah, so I, I did have that comment that you had in my head about the pacing of this, and I would agree. I think the they were too slow to advance, especially the past. I thought the 1930s stuff where they don't even have the powers yet, and this whole family dynamic that could have been that could have been collapsed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I actually would have been more interested to see maybe instead of the island scene in episode seven if the island scene had been like in episode three and then the flashbacks had become more the early days of the union, like when they're yeah. sort of that, I think I might've been a little more hooked into because yeah, yeah. they kept referring to it, right? The code it used to work, this is, but you didn't really see, see like how it the villain fight of like how it worked and how it inspired. So I actually think when you said it was spot on was like, it was stretched and too slow especially in the flashback for me. So yeah. the kids, I actually kind of, I had never seen those act, that actor and actress before. I thought they were decent. Um, Brandon and uh, Chloe. I thought they were like, the actor, the actor did a decent job, but, uh, and you know who I actually uh, under, actually I liked was, um, and I hadn't seen him in a while, was Tyler Main, uh, the former wrestler who played Sabretooth in the original X-Men is Blackstar. And I actually thought for the little oh. bit that we got a black star, he was actually decent, like for yeah, sort of yeah. a big brute and he was yeah, kind of yeah. smart. I was like, oh, that's kind of fun. But no, nah, I just, this one just didn't, didn't work. If we, if there is a season two, I think you're commenting on it by yourself. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to watch it. I'll, I'll say, I'll be like, hey, Brian, you got to check this one out. <laughs> 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 uh, but yeah, let us, let us know in the conversation what you thought of uh, Jupiter's Legacy. Uh, let's get into some quick rumors. Yeah. So apparently for Doctor Strange 2, there, there's the rumor going around that Ghost Rider is going to show up. Now, let me say this. It, Doctor Strange 2 being a, being shown as a horror film for Ghost Rider to pop up makes sense. Because for me, if you're seeing somebody in, in, in like in, 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 you know, with a skull with his with his head on fire, that's scary. It should be scary. It right. shouldn't be something that you're used to seeing on film and not feeling a certain way about it. Because then it gets too old. It's like having the Hulk throughout the whole movie. It gets too old, too quick. So, if they can make the Ghost Rider a scary individual, it it works. Just like if you make the Hulk a scary individual, but somewhat, someone that you root for is similar to Ghost Rider, then it works. But it has to have that element of like, like you know, uh, 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 you know, horror in it. It makes sense. What do you think about this uh, possible Ghost Rider cameo? You know, I read the same thing. Uh, I set, read a separate story as well about rumors of Mads Mikkelsen's Kaecilius also coming back in this. You know what's hard for, I think, for us to examine is we, because we're into this multiverse era, but we haven't seen a movie that employs it yet. It's hard for me to contextualize nuggets like this because like, is it, hey, we're going to jump into Earth 616 or, or, or another Earth and then we're going to have a passing scene where we see a character? Yeah. I mean, that is fun, but not exactly meaningful to the story. Or is a Ghost Rider appearance actually like a prelude to Ghost Rider really being a, a player in the MC? We don't know that yet. Yeah. And so, my own, I mean, my thing is like Doc Strange 2 has so much intrigue. That's not a movie that to me, we just said Wakanda Forever, we need a few more characters to really understand where we're going. I feel the opposite about Doc Strange 2. I think WandaVision has given us either enough existing characters or a pathway to a Mephisto or, or a Thon to where I don't think we need a whole lot more for that movie to be huge. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I guess my when I see it, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm never, 
I'll never mistrust Marvel for where they put their characters, but I don't know that Doc Strange 2 is a character that needs Johnny Blades yeah. to make anything work. Again, in this film, anything is possible. This could be the beginning of uh, Marvel's MonsterVerse, werewolves, uh, vampires, all that other stuff. Um, and it could lead to what's that that storyline all that team of the midnight midnight run midnight i forget is a is a is a is a team of blade ghost rider yeah. uh Mo, mobius um morbius and, and and some others so we could be getting a tease to the beginning of that possibly yeah. um so again we'll see what if this actually happens and there's some fans that want um, Keanu Reeves, I mean, it seems to me that Marvel to, is always talking to Keanu Reeves about what roles are possibly available to him. I think the number one role for him, if, and before I get into that, for Ghost Rider, it makes sense because he's a, he's a, he's a motorcycle rider. Mm. He, he, that's his thing. Right? I think he even owns a company uh, of motorcycles or whatever the case may be. And it makes sense. And he sort of has that sort of um, um, character that 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 can you can say you can you can think of him as a Ghost Rider sort of that Johnny Blaze type character. That's fine. But for me, uh, Keanu Reeves should be the Beyonder. Perfect. You don't got to do a lot. You don't even got to be in multiple movies. Just one Secret Wars. That's it. It's done. Keanu Reeves is, is not going to live forever. He's up there in age. He still has that look, but he doesn't need to be in like five Ghost Rider films. You know what I'm saying? So Beyond would be the role for him. Yeah. Uh, but let's see. Let's see um, what this cameo, if it in fact it is going to be happening and what it uh, holds for the future of, of, of um, you know, the monsterverse of the MCU. I think the story also was trying to extrapolate that Ghost Rider would not have its own franchise. That Ghost Rider would be kind of like Hulk, right? That was the idea that if it pops up in this film, it would then get slightly bigger roles, but always be a sidekick type yeah. of character in, in multiple projects versus anchoring its own franchise like they tried to do with, yeah. with Nick Cage back in the day. So. Yeah. But I'm with you. Keanu's also busy, right? I mean, John Wick, I think they're at least doing two more of those. Yeah. And then I heard they're doing a sequel to 47 Ronin, which didn't do that well, but was a that's a, a long shoot if he does it. And then, I mean, I don't know if we want to, then there's the other rumor that the other part of Disney might be talking to him too for another project, Star Wars, which actually sounded kind of exciting. So he's, I mean, he's in demand, right? He's hot. And so yeah, even though yeah. he's older, he has no shortage of um, projects to look at. So Yeah. And what's... Uh, and, oh, and the Matrix. Yeah. I, if Matrix 4 is big, there's going to be a Matrix 5. So, you know, he may not be done with that. Hey, Kevin, get somebody else for Ghost Rider. Give him Beyonder. He doesn't have a lot to do probably two weeks of filming <laughs> come on there's a no-brainer um there's also a rumor that we're possibly getting a solo hulk film now if this is the case then we can assume that universal don't, no longer has the rights to the uh, hulk and possibly namer name more um and they're talking about this Hulk being a, a trilogy of World Breaker Hulk. I know everybody's sour, including myself, over how the Hulk was portrayed in the second half of phase three of the Avengers, Infinity War, Endgame, and, and Ragnarok. They have a lot of decision making to do if they go about doing the Hulk a solo film. We, you and I both agree that they don't have, I don't think they have the option of doing Planet Hulk anymore. No. Which I think would have been amazing if they did. Um, so how they go about bringing this version of the Hulk and I think it should be done without Ruffalo. I think Ruffalo, I think it should be let go to get somebody else to do the whole. Yep, I agree. And bring in more 
of the, the, the characters that revolve around the Hulk, like Betty Ross, Rick Jones. And uh, I think this possibly may be, if they go about doing this, may be the beginning of these other Hulk characters, the leader, Amadeus Chow, and, and, and others um, for the Marvel uh, for the Marvel Universe. It seems like they're building a lot of different pieces of the Marvel Universe in these films. What are your thoughts on the Solo Hulk film if they do do it? And because if they do do it, then we definitely get to see possibly that Wolverine was his Hulk, which is something that most people are looking forward to seeing. So you, you brought up the rights. That's obviously the key question. I've not seen a confirmation either way that they're free of that. I'm actually going to kick it back to you. Why don't you think Hulk has worked as a film? So, I, you know, I, I have my, the Ang Lee version. I don't know that we were quite there effects wise. I think Hulk himself looked a little doughy and kind of a little weird in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we did get there, though, an incredible Hulk. Like oh, we yeah. were there. They, yeah, it looks like fun. So why don't you think like Hulk, which arguably started more famous than Iron Man did, why is that and is a good toy obviously for kids like why is that not resonated in your mind as a blockbuster standalone i think it has to do with the bruce banner aspect um i think in the beginning with ruffalo his bruce banner was done very well um and it go, even going back further um what's this guy's name the guy that played the original hulk in the this tv show Oh, uh, Bill Bixby? Bill Bixby. Bill Bixby was dope. Yeah. It was his character, his unwillingness and his fear of becoming the Hulk. You know, and moving from place to place because he can't he can't be there no more because of what you know, if he changed to the Hulk in one area, then forget it. Everybody's just gonna you know, go dive in into that area and ask a lot of questions and he couldn't be around that. Um, I think that piece of the Hulk uh, story has been lost. Because um, when you see the Hulk and him smashing and doing it, it's cool. I mean, in the Incredible Hulk, we got the Hulk sound, clap, the Hulk smash. Those were dope, but how, how much can you do that, right? That's right. just one, you know. But I think what worked with Incredible Hulk is, was with Ed Norton not wanting to be the Hulk and and his and him trying to cure himself and only using him when he absolutely had to. So I think, I don't know how many of those can you do in a film, but certainly in a film without other characters, let's say like Doc Samson and Rick Jones, a lot of elements, it just can't be about that. I think with Bill Bixby, it was just about that and his struggle with the Hulk and then other people trying to find out who's who and who's what. But in a film, you have to have these other characters chime in to make this movie work. So, and it leading to World Breaker Hulk, and having those adversaries that actually pose a threat um, is needed. So there's a lot of a lot of things to work with in order to make a Hulk movie work. It just can't be the Hulk smashing throughout the whole film because that's not going to work. No, but it just it just goes back to I mean you know Ed Norton, big time actor. I mean William Hurt, big time actor. Liv Tyler was you know still kind of a list when she was but like so they've done it with big names I, like i said i think the effects in the louis leterrier version were good audience just hasn't really rallied around this as its own thing and maybe you're right maybe it's that hulk can't totally ride alone like there has to be a second superhero alongside and, and a real name brand one like you said maybe it is a wolverine i don't that seems like a stretch for this go around but that that caliber of name with an actor to go along with that to really sell this. But, you know, I mean, I'm not surprised they're trying, if they have the rights, I'm not surprised at all they're trying it. It would be the first time they have free reign to do it. But yeah, I think 
I wouldn't be surprised if this was budgeted more like Ant Man than like yeah. Captain America. You know what I mean? Just to kind of protect against this being not as big as as the other franchise. And I and also I think in order for it to work, it can't be this hokey type film. It can't be an Ant Man. It has to be a scary situation. The Hulk is a monster. He's not the one you take pictures with and listen to. No, 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 no. Hulk in a in a, in a Sean John sweater. No. <laughs> he can't be that Hulk. Hulk is scary. When I was a kid watching the Incredible Hulk shows, I was like, like when he turned into the Hulk, he was like, yeah. and the transformation. And then and he he was there for like five minutes and then that's it. Yeah. Then it's all Bill Bixby. So I guess you you got to be able to play in, in that zone. But when the Hulk arrives, he has to be scary. And how I don't know how you do that, being what you've done so far. You know, everybody likes the Hulk. Yay, Hulk. You know, for me, the Hulk now is not so much different than the thing almost. Hmm. You know, it's like, how do you make the thing unique other than he's orange and he can talk? Right, and everybody likes him. You know, with the Hulk, everybody seemingly likes him. Probably not in the films, but in the audience, the audience, the people that are paying the money, you ha you have to have a different sort of feeling when the Hulk is around, and yeah. that's what they're gonna have to do in order to make this a little bit of more of a compelling character than what they've shown so far. So, we'll see. We'll see. Um. We've covered a lot today. Uh, a lot of things happening, a lot of news happening. Um, there's just, uh, we just got to wait and see what happens with Disney. We got to wait. There's a lot of wait and sees here. So, um, Brian, any last words? Well, last word is just from the extreme rumor mill where there's no confirmation, but I do have to, th that something that's been floating around and I keep waiting for a little more confirmation, but the idea of a star Wars project with Keanu Reeves, Gal Gadot, and maybe Henry Cavill, that's a Sith centric series or movie. That is different. I'm just saying if that's got any chance of reality, that is huge. I, it's like I said, we haven't gotten real confirmations yet, but that the rumor is sort of like Keanu as the emperor type character, Gaul as his daughter and then rumor is maybe Cavill's involved in some. I mean, that would be a fantastic casting if they pull that off. And, and the idea of like, hey, it's going to be a dark side oriented movie. And the light side is viewed as you don't want to succumb to that. I'm here for it if they want to go for that. That sounds pretty cool. So I don't know. That really came that came across this week. And I was like, ah, this doesn't seem like it's solid yet. But everyone's talking to everyone these days. That's the other thing. You know, like Hollywood is reopened. You're going to see a lot of these nuggets and we know who's in demand and who's available. I mean, you know, I think Marvel and Disney would be dumb not to talk to Henry Cavill, right? It's like, we know his Superman is sort of in limbo. He's got some success with the Witcher. He's, he's, he's available, right? So, yeah, and he's got yeah, a following. So if you can yeah. get him in one of your franchise, do it. So that's definitely doing something different right there. If they go to the other point of view, because uh, I definitely enjoyed those moments where you're in, I guess the barracks of the 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 the, the, the republic, yeah. with the you know, and how they they have a freaking lunchroom and stuff, Gee. <laughs> and they're talking. That's cool to me. That's a different side of if they were to do that, that would be very very interesting to see, especially with 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 Keanu Reeves and Gal Gadot and Henry Cavill. If they were able to pull something off like that, everybody's gonna be you know curious to see what that would be and what that would look like. So. Let's not see, solid man. yet take yeah, it with a yeah, grain of yeah, salt yeah, but yeah, like last word having fun with something that that's kind of was something that yeah. came across the desk this week but no it's ex it's exciting we're what we're how we're less than a month away from loki so yeah uh, yeah and I'm, I'm my needle is tipping closer to black widow in the theater for what it's worth so what what do we have right now we have right now that is going to be simultaneously, simultaneously released in the theaters and in, on Disney Plus, correct? So it's done deal, done deal. So we got confirmation. Shang Chi is theater only. Black Widow is both. Forty five days. Initially, so initially, I was like, I'm going to pay the thirty bucks and stay at home. And 
Oh, my needle's moving a little bit closer to going to the theater. May not be able to stay away. May need to go to the theater. I'm with you, man. I'm with you because the, the talk that I've been saying that this may be on par as, as Winter Soldier, that, you know, it deserves a watch in the theater. So let's see. I mean, there's 30 bucks. They still ask their pockets. Then I don't know. I might just stay home. Who knows? Let's see. But that's our show for today. Please, everybody, hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that notification bell. Share it with your friends. It really does help support the channel. And we will see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report.